Thanks for all coming out. What I want to do over the next 20, 25 minutes is always just give you a feel for what our lab has done in mammalian synthetic biology, give you a feel for what we are doing, what we're planning to do, as well as a sense of the challenges we have in this field and the applications. So like many of the speakers we heard from yesterday, Pam, Ron, Martin, and others, our lab is focusing primarily on synthetic gene networks. So we're going in using modeling, going with different schematic designs. Uh, we'll find the wet parts to match those schematics, put them into plasmids or constructs, get into cells, see if they function that way. So we started well over a decade ago playing with things like genetic toggle switches, RNA switches, counters, timers, genetic switchboards, and sorts. And as you know, on the toggle switch, we've got basically a bistable system, two different genes that are consistently expressed. They're trying to shut each other off. And we're able to show that if you balance it properly, you can get it so that it is truly bistable. It exists in state A, gene A is on, gene B is off, or it exists in state B. Gene B is on, gene A is off. And you can flip it between those with transient delivery of chemical or environmental stimuli. Well, as many of you know, you know, from a historical perspective, most of us in SINBAO from the beginning really were focusing on microbes. Why? Well, we were, for the most part, amateurs in molecular biology. Working on microbes was a lot easier. They were small, they were simpler, and yet it still was incredibly hard. So as we saw really now almost 10 years ago with efforts by Martin Fusenager and Ron, Christina was that as we began to think about these microbes, which have been sequenced, people got intrigued. Could you go from organism to lower organisms to higher organisms that had both been sequenced and had done sequencing? So could we move synthetic biology into folks like George? And could we reprogram George? Not that we'd want to, but reprogram George. And as we began to think about things in our lab, we took on the challenge of doing a mammalian toggle switch. And what was interesting is we burned through two postdocs without getting a mammalian toggle switch. And around the time that the second postdoc was not happy with the progress he was making, Martin Fusenager, who's still here, he and Biak Kram actually published a mammalian toggle switch in Nature Biotech. This is 2004. At that time, I lucked out that Tara Deans came in my lab. So Tara was a grad student who had done three years of graduate work in cell biology at Harvard. So she was not an amateur in molecular biology. She wanted to become a bioengineer. So she came into a program at BU that allows you to transition into engineering. And she came into my lab and began looking at it and says, OK, Jim, you know, the big challenge why you guys aren't getting your toggle switch to work is you don't have tight enough repression. Right? To get it to really, truly be bistable, you got to have the guy that's shutting the guy off truly getting that guy off. So Tara sat back and said, OK, what I think the field could benefit from is a really good, tight, inducible switch. So as she thought about it now as a burgeoning amateur engineer, experienced molecular cell biology, she says, OK, why don't we try to harness the two things we know you can do to shut stuff off? So let's take account of repressors, but also let's take account of RNAi. So what she designed, as shown here, was a modular mammalian gene switch that would use repressors to shut off transcription. And then she had a beautiful RNAi design where she could tag the gene of interest that she wanted to shut off with a specific RNA design that if you had some leakage, and leakage is a huge problem in this field, whether you're bacteria, yeast, or mammals, that if it leaked out, you could then knock it down with that system. Now, she would have to also be able to flip the system on, which she could do with, in this case, IPDG as an inducer, which then would flip on TET, shutting off LAC, and then shutting off also the intervening aspects on the RNAi. Well, how did she do? Well, she initially did some nice spec, as we all do in SynBio, where she's got her uh, negative control, positive control. When she looks at just the repressors alone, she gets about 90% knockdown, which is typical. When she looked at the RNAi component alone, she got about 85% knockdown, which is, again, roughly typical. When she combined the two together in this SynBio framework, she got greater than 99% knockdown, which is really brilliant. Well, those who play in the male system, you know you can do with different Cree systems where you can have it on, then you get a permanent knockout, true off. This is basically true off or close to true off in a system that's reversible. So she shows here that she can flip the system on, shut it off, flip it back on multiple times. And it's like a dimmer switch. So she can go from a true off, take the lights off, or very low level, romantic dinner, to very high, right? Work on your R01 grants, and go up and down. And the beauty, as we saw with so many great talks yesterday, that as with many aspects in SynBio, it's highly modular. You can use it to control whatever gene you want, and you can pop in and out different promoters. You can have tissue-specific promoters that would say only act in certain tissue types or cell types. Well, Tara then went and did kind of a machismo demo. And the initial design here was really to show how tight this system was. 
but it also had an interesting application. So the tightness where she wanted to go after was she used the system to control the expression of DTA, which will express the diphtheria toxin, which, as many of you know, even a single molecule of which can kill off a cell. So Tara designed the system to be in the off state. She then actually created stable cell lines, grew them up five, six weeks, and then actually could induce them selectively, flipping on DTA and killing off the cells. So as many of you have interest primarily from the microbial side on kill switches, here's actually an inducible, very tight mammalian kill switch, which you can use for containment or eliminating your cell at a certain point if you had a therapy, or even thinking about it to create interesting animal models where you can grow up your animal and then wipe out certain cells or tissues of interest. Second, in an area that I think is really going to be growing in synthetic biology, and it already is, is thinking about synthetic biology not as the end, but as the tool, and not as the tool to demonstrate cool toys or applications, but as a tool to get after interesting questions of biology. So I think back to when I got into the field uh, broadly, a molecular biology 13, 14 years ago, coming from more of the physics and engineering. You know, we thought of genes as zeros and ones, on or off, and you played around Boolean networks and sorts, and then the field of the real biologists were appreciating more so that you had really rich set of dynamics depending on what the level of expression was of the gene. And as we move now from functional genomics from just comparing knockouts to on, people are very interested in seeing can you explore with thresholding what happens at different concentrations of a protein, different levels of expression. And Tara Switch, which is now being used by many, many labs, she was able to show, for example, controlling the expression of BACs, it's a proaptotic gene, that at actually interesting physiological levels you didn't get a phenotype but you had to exceed a certain threshold. And I think, again, these tools that we can bring will allow biologists now to ask different questions and explore different functions. Well, a thing that I think came through a bit yesterday, but I want to emphasize, as those of you who are in the lab doing this, you can appreciate that it's really hard to do this stuff. And that is, it takes a long time. And you know, we're jealous of our electrical engineering colleagues where they can do the design, build, test cycle in a matter of hours in many cases. For us, it's still on the order of many months and I think if we're going to advance this field, and there are a lot of talent in this room to do this, we need to ramp up our platforms and tools that we can go from many months to even just getting the construct to test it, not even having, say, if it's in the gene to see if it functions, but down to many days where you can test. And I'll come back to, hopefully, a short anecdote on that. And we're now, along lines with Ron Rice and others, exploring how you can develop those frameworks. So we did something like this in bacteria. We published just a few months ago. Where we created what we call a genetic breadboard. So we had a multi-cloning site. Uh, pl uh, plasma that we designed. We had a library of well-characterized parts that were designed that you could pop in and out readily into that cloning site. And in this case, then, you could now build up constructs, whether it's the, of the types of modules that Ron and, and uh, Martin spoke about yesterday. In this case, starting just on the uh, bacterial side, but for example, the toggle switch, which in our initial work back in 1999, 2000, it took us nine months, which then was short, and frankly still today is kind of short, to get a functioning toggle. With this platform, it took us five days to get the initial construct built and tested, and three days to spec it out iteratively to get it to function truly by stably. So in eight days, from start to finish, with this platform, we were able to get a functioning bacterial toggle switch that was by stable. Ron's group is doing something very similar right now in mammalian systems, and we're excited as well. Can you expand this? And the thing that we really need, in addition to faster synthesis and construction capabilities, is expanded parts lists. So with Mo Khalil, Tim Liu, Keith Pardee, Caleb Basher in our lab, well, one of the things we've done is use zinc finger engineering to come up with engineered uh, transcription factors based on the zinc fingers that are tunable. We can actually modify their corruptivity, and we can couple them to synthetic promoter designs that allow us to easily create different now, in this case, repressible or activatable synthetic gene networks. We initially did this in yeast. We're now moving or doing this in, in mammalian systems. Further, Roshan Kumar, who's here, along with support from Agilent, is looking to see, can we create an epigenetic toolbox? So that is, can we now take account of some beautiful work at the epigenetic level with chromatin, for example, to exploit that as you design your circuit? So Roshan, similar to what we did in bacteria, similar to what we had done with transcription factors, is now building parts that would allow us to activate, turn on, shut off, erase aspects of epigenetic programming. And it's, an, it's I think, a feature that is ripe to be exploited by folks in this room. Further, you know, we heard yesterday uh, challenges on uh, how, do you, I, how do you insulate your system? 
right? We've kind of been kidding ourselves that because we take stuff that's foreign to an organism, put it in the cell, we think, okay, it's isolated from that cell, or it's having no impact on the host cell. Well, as many of the biologists in the room can attest that that's really not what's happening, and I think many of us from the engineering side are beginning to appreciate how challenging that is. And so as part of Dan Wandorf's DARPA program, which supported some of the early work on our zinc finger transcription factors, we're also now working to use nucleases, to use recombinases, to engineer safe harbors in mammalian genomes. So to look for parts in the genome that are far away from regulatory regions that we can insert into our, the genome now, the constructs of interest, and then use systems biology tools that we and others have developed to assess how independent are these parts from the rest of the host cell, but as well as are we impacting the host cell? And we're excited about what we might be able to do then from applications with this kind of safe landing. Well, let's speak to applications. We heard about some of this yesterday. An area that we've been very excited about and we've been doing a lot of collaboration with George Daly is in the space of stem cells and stem cell engineering. So as many of you can appreciate, a few years ago, Yamanaka discovered that you could take as few as, say, on the order of about four transcription factors, deliver it to adult cells, and reprogram those cells into induced pluripotent stem cells. And the notion there is that now you could take cells out of people's bodies, reprogram them to become different tissue, different cell types that might be used for drug screening, that might be used eventually for regenerative medicine. Well, the approach is we're primarily using viral transfection. So with this now, the, the risk is that with the viral transfection, we can express those transcription factors, you're going to modify the genome. And you can carry a cancer risk or uh, other concerns. Well, with Derek Rossi and George Daly, we actually took a synthetic biology approach. What we did was develop synthetic mRNAs. We didn't need viral transfection. You could deliver now the Yamanaka factors or others as mRNA directly into the cell and show that you could do reprogramming. We could do at higher efficiency than what had been reported and at a shorter period of time. What's interesting about that, who have followed in this field, this very related technology by Derek on these kind of highly stable mRNAs, synthetic mRNAs, is now part of a technology at Moderna, which is a local biotech company, that actually just announced a $240 million deal with AstraZeneca around this to create new therapeutics. And so, you know, if people say SynBio is not having an impact, I think it depends on what you call SynBio and how far you, de how far you de deep and, and go. Second, and related, and I'll just bring this up as an anecdote, that with George's group, we also use systems approaches, and this was done uh, just a couple years ago, a few years ago, where we showed you could convert peripheral blood to induce pluripotent stem cells. And so this was uh, work with George's group where we just kind of helped on characterizing. And prior to that, people had primarily focused on fibroblasts. Uh, and you know, Rudy Yanish is here, and I'm so happy, he's a true stem cell pioneer, and so if you have a chance to talk, uh, to Rudy, it breaks. I strongly encourage you to. And again, I applaud the organizers for getting so many real biologists and world-class biologists here because we need their input. Well, the reason I bring this up is when we actually published this along with the mRNA, our friend Rob Carlson, who writes a lot about SynBio, wrote a piece in the New York Times where he says, ah, these two studies coming out of the Daily Collins lab now gives you the possibility for DIY biology to do your own stem cell engineering. That is, in your garage lab, you can now take your own blood put it into an mRNA bath, create your own stem cells, and do your own experiments and therapy. I'm like, oh my gosh, that was not our intended objective. <laughs> it opens up for interesting perspectives, but nonetheless, it inspired Ron to think of such. Well, as you now think of kind of the Flash Gordon, I'm going to come to more short term, you can get excited thinking about, could you use synthetic biology to do in vivo reprogramming? That is, could we get to the point where you could have encapsulated syn constructs, whether it's a decision-based circuitry, or synthetic mRNAs that could be designed to go after a particular cell type or tissue type or site of injury or site of age in a patient, deliver the cargo, reprogram those cells, and then at some time later, redifferentiate them into other tissues of interest. So the reprogramming is still a very exciting area. The real interest now is trying to get into how do you figure out once you have either your embryonic stem cells or your iPS cells, how do you make them into what you want? Well, we've been now intrigued with Keith Pardee and others of actually getting after delivery and containment through engineered liposomes and exosomes. So the idea here, and Keith's developed a very nice platform, is that we can now engineer these systems as safe delivery vehicles and as encapsulation units that can go into patients or to be used for in vitro, and I'll come back to that in a second. And so 
Here you've got really two modes you can think about this. So you can think about using the exosome, similar to what Novartis did in their vaccine talk yesterday, where you can have them loaded up with cargo, be it mRNA, proteins, or synthetic circuits, get into a cell, burst, and deliver the payload to the cytoplasm. Or directly addressing also the challenge on how do you insulate these guys and isolate them from the host physiology, you can think about using the vesicles as containment vehicles. So either they themselves could be the cell sentinel, the synthetic sentinel swimming around the body or in the dish, or they could be taken up by the cell and contain whatever the cargo or, say, the machinery of interest transcription translation inside that cell. And Keith's been exploring both of these as applications. So the initial one is came in and used, in this case, uh, microvesicles to deliver just simply, in this case, plasmids to express M. cherry into human cells. Initial efforts had low efficiency, but you know, shown in the green are the actual vesicles, and then in red are the cells that have taken up the vesicles and are expressing M. cherry. Got it to work, and he has since improved the efficiency, shifted to exosomes, now actually using drugs to encourage uh, uh, endosome release. He's got now much higher efficiency for plasma delivery, and he's actually shown you can use the microvesicles, these exosomes specifically, to deliver small molecules, to deliver proteins, to deliver mRNA. So you go back to Harvey Lodish's talk. Harvey, and I think it's an interesting challenge for many of the young people in the audience, is to think about something that the field hasn't done a lot of, and that is shifting to the protein space. So can we think about engineering protein centers? Can we think about engineering protein switches that could operate in red blood cells, that could operate in other settings such as this? The other big space, and I, I shared the, that I was going to speak briefly, is that as we think about applications, you know, therapeutics, that's a 10, 15, 20-year horizon. And for many of us, I don't know how much time some of us will have on that, that's a long horizon. And as we think about applications, a space that I think is getting not enough attention in synthetic biology is the in vitro space. And that is thinking about taking cells out of patients to do in vitro applications, thinking about using synthetic vesicles with synthetic biology cargo to do in vitro applications. I'll speak to a related space and uh, success stories that were involved, Tim Lewis here and myself, with a company called Sample 6. So Sample 6 was spun out of my lab based on Tim's work, where they're now using synthetic biology to develop an in vitro diagnostic for bacterial pathogens in the food industry. They're using engineered bacteriophage, and they're at a point now where they can detect as few as 10 cells for under, say, 10 bucks in a matter of just a few hours, three hours, which is dramatically shorter than we need for sampling in typical in the industry. They're doing a soft product release in July this year and a hard product release in early 2014. And why the in vitro is interesting to think about for the engineers in the audience is that the regulatory barriers are down at the floor, the development time is very short, and it's a much easier thing to think about. So Keith and our group, and I encourage people to think about this, are now Think about how you can use these engineered exosomes, how you can think about using engineered vesicles as containment vehicles for in vitro. So can you tag them to glass and initially say create a closed system where you have all your transcription translation machinery inside the exosome of the vesicle. Maybe you allow uh, lipophilic molecules to come in to interact with your schemes. Well, Keith got it to work really nicely. In this case, show on the left is the actual uh, device, the right is just the control, where he's got all the stuff needed, transcription translation machine inside the vesicles in a closed scheme, where he's got the nucleotides, amino acids, ATP, et cetera, inside, and he gets beautiful expression. Well, if you want to think about both in vivo but also interesting in vivo, you want to have a semi-permeal system, right? You want to be able to detect things like RNA. You want to be able to detect other small molecules that are present. And Keith's now developed a semi-permeal system where now he allows stuff coming in out and shown his beautiful demo, again, in vitro, where he's got everything that he needs inside these engineered containment vehicles except for the nucleotides. The nucleotides are inside the media and he shows they can actually get in and the system will respond. Well, a great demo was he then went further and integrated an RNA-based sensor that was developed by Alec Green in our lab as part of a collaboration with Pam Silver that's based on a riboregular design. So now he's got this sensor inside the vesicles and he's got RNA, RNA that he wants to detect that's outside the vesicle. And he's actually able to show that he can pick these guys up. So you can now think about whether this might be delivered into breast cells along the lines of what uh, Ron's group did a few years ago, or whether you're going to have it in this blood in a patient, or probably more realistic, on the outside, where you could look at samples of sputum, you could look at samples of blood, you could look at urine, you could look at breath to make certain measurements. And you could even think about drying these and have paper-based diagnostics. So there's a whole host of things for everybody to think about. And I want to end with just two slides. 
And that is, you know, when I think about mammalian synthetic biology, I try to think a little broader. So almost everything we're seeing, which has been at such a great workshop so far, is really focused on the mammalian cell and how you're going to engine the mammalian cell. But I want everybody here to also think about how you can impact mammalian biology with synthetic biology by re-engineering the microbiome. So we're really beginning to appreciate how those 10 to 100 more bacterial cells that make up our bodies compared to mammalian cells are influencing our regular health, are influencing disease and age, different things that break down. And so we and others are very excited about how you can use SynBio to re-engineer bugs either that are already in your gut or to engineer probiotic strains that could be introduced into individuals to address different needs. So we recently got support, for example, from the Gates Foundation, where we're engineering lactobacillus in order to enable them to detect and respond to cholera. So the notion here is we're engineering them with a decision-based circuit, such as an analogic gate that would respond to two quorum sensing molecules that are given off by cholera. If it senses those, it would then flip on and produce an antimicrobial peptide that's specific for cholera and go after cholera. This is in practice. We're starting to get some stuff in a dish. This isn't yet even in a mouse. But the notion here is that given the cholera drugs are expensive, given the cholera drugs are toxic, here you would spike it into yogurt or in a pill that could be relatively cheap, that could be given out in the face of a cholera outbreak, for example, in Haiti, and only those that would be exposed, or with high probability, only those that would be exposed would have this express. And so as we think, you know, we have all these tools that for over a decade now have been developed in bacteria. Don't think you're not in a position to do mammalian synthetic biology. And with that, let me just thank the, the real network that I'm proudest of is all the great young people in my group that have done all the great work. And with that, why don't I open up for a few questions. week to get it to work in your, in your, in your new plasmid uh, platform that you developed. Did you have to refactor that toggle, or did it just work when you dropped it? It didn't just work. So we, we had to refactor it. And that is that we, we had to make adjustments to the parts on the basis of how the initial design worked. So it took us five days to get the initial construct. And then it took us another three days to refactor the different parts. Now, in fairness, we obviously, we've been playing with toggles for 13, 14 years, so we kind of knew what we needed to do. And there's, there's no replacement for the expertise that you build from actually playing with a system. But nonetheless, we were able to now do that in the order of the, the three days of so-called refactoring of those parts. Yeah, no, we, we don't have enough parts. That's probably, I think, a central challenge. Uh, I think we're kidding ourselves thinking we have a lot of parts. And, and let me elaborate that, uh, you know, you'll hear about kind of the TTL comparison. You'll see these large handbooks that folks have. And, you know, it's the, those TTL handbooks, it's not that there's a, a million different parts. It's, it's maybe a thousand, but there's a thousand versions of each of those thousand. And that's what we're lacking. Right now, we maybe have, we're playing, you know, in the bacterial, it was maybe two dozen. I'm not sure how many is populating RONs, but you know, maybe the mammalian side, maybe it's not even that that we've got characters. It's We as a field need to move now where you go even beyond the two dozen, but say for each of those, you have a, a thousand variants that are well characterized for the organism that you have, at least from relative terms. And then speak to, I know a topic that's, that's close to many of us here, is how you can couple that to, say, interesting CAD-based or modeling to speed up your design. But no, we're significantly hampered by the lack of suitable number and diversity of well-characterized parts across all the organisms. Jim, I have a question. So I really like your idea of using synthetic biology to interrogate cell physiology outside of a patient, let's say. And certainly that's a big area of interest for patient-derived iPSCs and so on. So I wondered if you can comment on what sort of synthetic biology tools or maybe circuits or even strategies might be needed 
uh, in order to meaningfully uh, perturb or characterize what, for example, makes a disease harboring patient different from another patient if we're looking at a comparison between either their mature cells or iPSCs or something like this. Yeah, so I, I think uh, th there's, a, there's a few things that I think would be beneficial. One is to really move toward uh, easy to use and modular sensors to start, and that is that we don't, we don't actually have good characterization of what distinguishes different folks. And we spoke briefly on this, is that you have this still push for biomarkers. And unfortunately, most biomarkers are just statistical based. They'll grab, they'll do an analysis discriminant. And I think SynBio has the opportunity to come up with easier to use tools that can give you biological insight into what is the difference between the cells. Second, and this is an area we're very excited about, is how do you get to the redifferentiation? So if I'm going to take cells out of a patient, now I have this IPS, and now I've got this magical goes into these different cell types. Well, most efforts right now to create the different cell types is it's going to be media-based or actual substrate-based, whereas really the biology is, is largely or in part dictated by transcription factors. And I think SynBio, so that I know there's a number of synthesis companies, Gen9 and others here, is to think about how you can get after rapid development of expression constructs that would allow you to explore quickly what happens if you turn on or turn off three, four, five transcription factors. So for example, I'm working with Pankaj Mehta, who's a physics professor at BU. He's come up with a beautiful way, on the base of expression data, he can identify sets of transcription factors that would underlie certain transitions. We submitted this, some of you may have reviewed it, and said, oh, this is great, no experiment, we don't like it. Now he's gone back trying to do the experiment. Well, it's gonna take him six to 12 months, primarily because of the front end time of developing those constructs. So I think the challenge in this space is, can SINBAO reduce the time that it takes us to get the expression profiles, and can we then, get after, US, can we get after dynamic expression, right? So we also are kidding ourselves. You watch, you watch these beautiful developmental schemes and it's not just, oh, okay, now they're on, everybody's on. You go, you, know, you have this beautiful orchestra of turning things on and off and that's where the SynBio circuits, whether they're autonomously programmed to do this orchestra or whether you can induce them, will I think make a big difference in the next decade. Hi. Uh, Hi. For your uh, cell free systems, uh, is there is there like a half life to the parts there, or is there any way to regenerate like the DNA or RNA? Uh, so we're early on that. Um, so the the say semi permeable, you can actually say put the the material actually in the media, mm -hmm. so you can have it come in, and you can also design it so you can get rid of the junk, right? So you can get ATP out that's going to suppress some reactions, mm -hmm. and that would probably be our plan to come in. Uh, you know, on the diagnostics, you can also envision where you, you're really going to try to go for speed in many cases. So it's the flip end, right? Can we get fast readout? Can we actually put it in an easy to use fashion? And that is, you don't want somebody doing the full mix. Can you have it, as I alluded, dried on a piece of paper or have it in a chip where you can just drop stuff on? But the notion would be with semi permeable, we could flow back in, whether it's the nucleotides, uh, the constructs, the amino acids, ATP. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much.